Liu Bei, the virtuous idealist, widely known as a benevolent and humane ruler, honest and kind to his friends and well liked by his companions. He is a modest and merciful warlord who cherishes his devoted followers. Even though he grew up in a poor family, he was full of ambition and always seemed destined for greatness, and despite his common roots, the blood of ancient Han emperors flows through his veins. Hello, my name is Mr. Smardonkey and today we're going to be taking a look at the ins and outs of Liu Bei's faction in Total War Three Kingdoms. Let's start off with Liu Bei's character and faction specializations. Liu Bei's unique character traits are plus 4 public order and minus 50% upkeep cost for militia infantry. These traits sound like they would make Liu Bei's faction perfect for an early game rush, but unfortunately Liu Bei has an early game limitation that lets him only recruit a single army as opposed to the free armies other factions can recruit. However, once Liu Bei increases his special unity resource, he will increase in rank much faster than other factions, allowing him to recruit more armies which will allow him to snowball pretty fast. So what exactly is the unity resource? Every faction has a different unique resource, and in Liu Bei's case it is unity, which when increased will give him more prestige, which is what you need to go up in rank. It will unlock more administrator positions, and it increases your income. Satisfied characters as well as winning battles will increase your unity. Finally, unity can be spent on annexing Han territory or increasing the satisfaction of your generals for unique assignments. Liu Bei's playstyle focus is companionship, meaning he needs to make many friends to stay alive, as he has quite a difficult start with a single army. Liu Bei has two unique units, these are Yi Archers and Yi Marksmen, which are both bow infantry with surprisingly good melee stats, but we'll go into more detail on them later. Liu Bei's unique building is the Shu Han Tax Collection, which is an upgraded version of the tax collection building available to other factions. Thanks to Liu Bei's reputation as an all-round stand-up guy, he is able to confederate other factions from the start of the campaign, something that other factions can't do until they reach a higher rank. Finally, Liu Bei has the ability to integrate, allowing him to annex Han Empire towns which we looked at earlier. Liu Bei is of course also accompanied by his two sworn brothers, the God of War Guan Yu and the drunken brawler Zhang Fei, whom we will look at in more detail later. On the campaign map, Liu Bei's starting position is an interesting one. Liu Bei has the strongest starting army in the game, but no place to call home. After a quick couple battles, you will be able to take the Iron Mine and Dong on turn 1 though, so that's what we'll call home for now. Even though the Iron Mine is not the capital of a commandery, but a simple resource building, it's not a bad place to start in. It provides a decent amount of income and some other bonuses such as construction cost reduction and a higher reserve capacity. That brings us to your neighbors. Starting in the west is Huang Xiao, one of the free playable Yellow Turban Rebellion factions. He will likely be your main adversary at the start of the campaign, as he owns the capital of Dong as well as the capital of Taishan to your north. While both towns make for prime targets, the Dong capital makes for the better price, as it is situated on the Yellow River and thus provides the unique harbor building which provides food, income from commerce and some other nice buffs. To your northeast are some Yellow Turban Rebels in the livestock farm of Bei Hai, a nice place to have for some extra food but acquiring it can be difficult as Kong Rong will generally beat you to it. To your southeast is the capital of Langye, owned by the Han Empire. You will get a mission to take this fairly early on in the campaign, and as Langye borders the ocean, it makes for a nice defensive commandery to use as a base of operations early on. To your south lives Tao Chan, in the farmland of Pang Cheng. You're better off becoming big butts with Tao Chan rather than conquering him though, as you will soon get a mission that allows you to confederate with him, so a violent takeover is not required. Finally, to your southwest are some yellow turban rebels in the temple of Pang Chang. I once again wouldn't worry about them though, as they'll get taken out by Tao Chan soon enough. Another tip I would give for the early game is to replace the one unit of Yi marksmen that Liu Bei starts with in his retinue. While the unit is significantly better than archer militia, it unfortunately isn't a militia infantry unit, and thus doesn't benefit from the 50% upkeep reduction meaning you could field 7 archer militia for the price of one Yi marksman, and while they're good, they're certainly not that good. Every faction starts with a reform already finished, and Liu Bei is no different, having resettlement incentives already unlocked, immediately providing him with some population growth and the livestock estate building unlocked. In terms of diplomacy, I would recommend immediately starting trade with Tao Chan upon taking the Iron Mine, and as soon as you unlock a second trade agreement, start trading with Kong Rong as well, both of whom you want to stay friendly with throughout the early game. As for Liu Bei's initial dilemma, I already touched on it a bit earlier, but to explain it in further detail. About a dozen turns in or so, you will get a message asking you to choose between joining Tao Chan's war against Cao Cao or staying out of it. 
If you decide to follow the story, you will soon be met with a message telling you of Tao Chan's imminent death, and you will be given his land in a sort of confederation deal. Following the story further has you confederate with Liu Biao as well, once again reinforcing Liu Bei's playstyle of companionship and conquering with smiles rather than by force. To finish off this category we'll have a quick peek at Liu Bei's family tree, and I really do mean quick as he doesn't have any family whatsoever, no wife, sons, nothing. Now it's time to take a peek under the hood of your legendary characters, starting with the main man himself, Liu Bei. The virtuous idealist is a commander, meaning he excels at inspiring friendly troops, but shouldn't be left in melee for too long. Because of his poor background he suffers from minus 25% income from family estates. Other than that he has plus one resilience, just like every other legendary lord, which means he essentially gets a second life and won't die the first time he gets taken out in battle. Other than that, he gets a bunch of stat increases and, of course, the faction-wide buffs we talked about earlier. Liu Bei's traits are kind, humble, and fraternal, which provide him, among other things, with faction-wide satisfaction, personal satisfaction, and lower desire for higher office, with the latter two being irrelevant for a faction leader. Liu Bei's starting skills provide him with buffs such as increased morale when attacking, battle running speed for his retinue, line of sight, and most importantly, an ability that gives him a 100% ranged block chance, temporarily making units in his range completely immune to missile fire. Finally, Liu Bei has his famed Shuang Gu Jian swords and his own unique armor. These provide him with incredible stat buffs as well as upkeep reductions for his retinue and passive encourage ability that increases the morale of units around him. Next up is Guan Yu, the god of war. Guan Yu is a champion, which makes him perfect for assassinating other generals, but weaker against regular units. His faction-wide bonuses provide armor for all spear infantry and morale when defending, but these are only active if he's prime minister, heir, or faction leader. Guan Yu's traits are honorable, fraternal, and intimidating, which among other things decreases his ambition, increases his personal satisfaction, and gives him immunity to scare effects. Guan Yu also starts off at level 4 as opposed to level 2, like the other legendary lords, which means he has more skills unlocked than others. These provide him with buffs such as increased replenishment, campaign movement range, morale when attacking, and most importantly, an ability that does a flat 15k damage to whomever he's fighting, whether that be a general or a regular unit. Finally, Guan Yu has his famous Green Dragon Crescent Blade and his own unique armor that provide him with massive stat bonuses, as well as a charge bonus and ranged block chance. Finally, there's Zhang Fei, the Drunken Brawler. Zhang Fei is a vanguard, which means he excels at breaking through enemy troops, but make him susceptible to other generals. His faction-wide effect is at plus 12% melee damage increase for all shock cavalry, but again, this won't be active unless he becomes prime minister, heir, or faction leader. Zhang Fei's traits are fiery, intimidating, and fraternal, which among other things provide him with charge speed, immunity to scare effects, and personal satisfaction. Zhang Fei's starting skills provide him with buffs such as the ability to scare nearby enemies, increased morale in own territory, and the active ability to reduce an enemy's melee evasion by 50% and deal small amount of splash damage. Finally, Zhang Fei has his renowned Serpent Spear and his own unique armor that provide him with huge stat increases as well as charge speed, melee attack rate, and fatigue immunity for his own retinue. All three of the Sworn Brothers also have the passive Oathsworn and Fallen Oathsworn effects, with the former giving small buffs when all three brothers are alive, and the latter providing a gigantic buff to the last survivor when two brothers fall in battle. It's time to talk about Liu Bei's unique units, of which there are two. The Yi Archers and Yi Marksmen, which are surprisingly similar to each other, but let's start with the former. Yi Archers are available for Liu Bei's generals once they reach level 3. They're a solid bow infantry unit for their price, as they're significantly better than the slightly cheaper regular archers, and they're a nice bridge to the next bow infantry unit of Onyx Dragons, or of course in Liu Bei's case, Yi Marksmen, so they provide a nice alternative to the otherwise supreme regular crossbowmen. Surprisingly though, their ranged stats aren't their selling point, it's their melee stats. They have an insane 40% melee evasion base stat accompanied by some respectable offensive melee damage stats. While this might sound useful on paper, it's not all that great in reality. You're paying top dollar for a unit that's supposed to be a fantastic at range, and one shouldn't have to rely on in melee. While it's nice that you can, I don't think it's worth their price. This is even further reinforced when you remember Liu Bei's 50% upkeep cost reduction for militia units, which makes their high upkeep cost even less appealing, as this is not a militia unit. Speaking of not being a militia unit, let's move on to the Yi Marksman, 
whom are not what you'd call a massive improvement, while being significantly more expensive. Yi Marksmen are available for Liu Bei's generals once they reach level 6. Besides a few extra arrows, the Yi Marksmen's range stats are identical to that of Yi Archers, which is not what you want to see from an even more expensive range unit. The money you spend on them goes into even better melee stats, but besides a slightly higher charge bonus and a bit of extra armor, there's not much of an improvement there either. You'd be better off investing in Onyx Dragons instead. All in all, Liu Bei's unique units don't make a particularly impressive impression, but who knows, they could be fantastic for a ranged only challenge run. That's going to do it for the Liu Bei faction overview. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and I shall do my best to answer them. Also let me know which faction you'd like to see covered next. Finally, if you're thinking of purchasing Free Kingdoms yourself, please consider getting it from 2Game, which is an official online retailer that provides you with a normal Steam key. You get the game quite a bit cheaper than directly from Steam, and an additional 10% discount if you use the code SMARTDONKEY at checkout. If the game is region locked for you, just change the currency on the top left of the screen and that'll fix it. If you'd like to just support me making this type of content instead, make sure to check out my Patreon page. All the relevant links will be in the description. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed. Have a good day and goodbye.